Well, it's that time of year again. It's our lead worship pastor's favorite time of year. Hallmark Christmas movies. Come on. All right. That's right. Okay. I knew there'd be at least three of you. Um, Hallmark Christmas movies. I I saw some interesting quotes about them this week. I got a kick out of them. Welcome to the Hallmark Channel at Christmas time. Always a happy ending and the plot doesn't matter. That's true. Uh, Someone else said, what has 15 actors, four settings, two writers, and one plot line? 632 Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> and then one lady said this. I love this comment. I thought this was hilarious. Lady said, Hallmark shows you how to fall in love with men. Lifetime shows you how to kill them. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. I can't go by personal experience, but that, that sounds about right. So that's pretty funny. So um, here's what's interesting about the Bible. As you read through God's word, here's here's what you discover. Much of the Bible reads more like a Hallmark Channel movie plot or a Lifetime Channel movie plot than it does just a stale religious document. It's fascinating. Like as you as you get into the Bible, as you get into God's word, like a lot of people approach it from the standpoint, you know, they think very generally about, oh, okay, um, the Ten Commandments or John three sixteen. And think of the Bible in terms of like um, just kind of like this religious document, and it's got these rules and expectations for us. When actually, one of the coolest things about the Bible is that it's really good and I would say engaging history. And when you get into the history of the Bible, what you discover is that it's presented to us very naturally as almost this plot that you would find in a Hallmark movie or a Lifetime movie. Yes, there are people who get murdered. (laughs) There are people who fall in love, right? And, And as you read through the record of human history as it's related to God's interactions with his people, honestly, it's... It's more movie plot material than it is just stale religious overtones. It's fascinating. The Bible's actually very good history. You know, like the Bible gives us tremendous specificity that myth and fable do not. Like, for example, like, like there's, there's nothing in any fable that says something like, and Zeus came out of heaven riding a powerful thundercloud. And it was about 4.15 in the afternoon. (laughs) You know, like the time specifics don't matter. But yet when you're reading through the Bible, what you find, especially in the New Testament, in the ministry of Jesus, is that there's such specificity of like when things are occurring, what day, what time of day. It's super specific. And you have specific towns and people and locations and people groups. And like the Bible is very specific. And then one of my favorite aspects of the Bible is like this hallmark lifetime plot running through human history is that the Bible doesn't hide the faults of its heroes. I mean, that's what makes it a hallmark-esque kind of read, you know? It's like, wow, there's a lot of dysfunction here. And uh, there's some love stories and there's some murder and there's some there's some broken people. And, like, and, and, and when you get into it, what you find is that the Bible provides a lot of specifics, a lot of history, but, but also um, it does not hide the faults of its heroes. And, and we could go all the way back, okay, like to, 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 to the patriarchs of the Jewish nation, okay? Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. And, and we know Abraham wasn't perfect and he late in life had this promised son, Isaac, who's gonna be the fulfillment that God had had told Abraham, like, what happened. Like, you're going to have a son, and you're going to be the father of a great nation, right? And it's hard to be the father of a great nation when you're well into your 90s and you don't have any kids. And so late in life, God gives him a son, Isaac. And then Isaac has two sons, twins, actually, Esau and Jacob. And Esau was the firstborn, and he was favored by Isaac. And Jacob was the younger son, and he was favored by his mother, Rebecca, because the babies are always favored by their mamas. 
Okay, some of you are thinking about it. You're just not admitting to it. Okay, all right. That's not the point of the message. Okay, so I just want you to see, like, there's this dysfunction, okay? There's this dysfunction where, where Isaac is favoring the older and Rebecca is favoring the younger and there's this tension in the family and late in life when Isaac's about to like pass on the family blessing, that would speak to inheritance, legacy, like the path of, of God's blessing. All these things that were first given to Abraham are gonna be channeled through Isaac to whoever he blesses. And of course, it's expected he's gonna bless the firstborn son because that's what you're supposed to do. And Isaac's definitely gonna do that because he favors his firstborn son anyway, Esau. And, and, and when you look at Esau and Jacob in this dynamic, like not only were they firstborn, secondborn, different from that perspective, they were also two entirely different people. Esau was a man's man. He loved to hunt, right? Um, his parents named him Fuzzy because he was covered with hair from the moment he was born. And, and they name him Harry, basically, is his name. And, and he's a man's man. And he, he's, he's got a Rottweiler that he puts in the passenger seat of his Ford F-150 riding around, listening to Morgan Wallen. And he's, he's a hunter and he's just a man's man, right? And Jacob is like totally the opposite. He's more Park Avenue, wears skinny jeans and Toms, Right? Like, that's Jacob. Like, he, he drives a Tesla, <laughs> you know? Like, like that's Jacob. And, 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 he, and he listens to Taylor Swift. That's just kind of who he is. So, like, the, these brothers could not be more different. And the time comes for Isaac in his old age to bless his favored firstborn son. But his wife has a plan. Okay, just think Lifetime Hallmark movie here. This is gonna be some jacked up stuff, okay? Because she says, she says to her younger son, here's what we're gonna do. Your father in his old age doesn't see very well and your older brother is out hunting to prepare a special food for your father so that he can confer the blessing. And so here's what I'm gonna do. I know how to make that. I'm gonna make the food. You pretend to be your older brother. Now, how did that happen? Well, they had to take a dead goat and take the hide off of it. And Jacob had to cover himself with this dead goat so that when Isaac felt his arms, they were hairy like his brother. And let me just say, if people have to imitate you by covering themselves with a dead goat, (laughs) you have a hygiene problem, okay? And so Rebecca's like, here, Cover yourself in this fur and your father will think that it's your brother and then I'll bring the food in and he's gonna give you your brother's blessing. And that's exactly what happens. And so they were in on it, the younger brother and the mother and then the firstborn Esau comes in later and Isaac recognizes he'd been duped. And Esau is not happy and he hops in his Ford F-150 with his shotguns and he chases down his brother and his brother's fleeing for his life and he hops in his Tesla and he he speeds out of town, man. And um, he ends up at his uncle Laban's property. And that's where he's gonna live because he couldn't go back home because his brother was gonna kill him because now the blessing of God first given to Abraham, extending through Isaac, is gonna come through the younger Jacob, not the older Esau, and Jacob can't go back home because his older brother's gonna kill him. And so he just kind of sets down at Uncle Laban's house, and uh, lo and behold, Uncle Laban has a couple daughters. One's name is Rachel, and one is Leah. Rachel, the Bible says, is shapely and beautiful. Leah is described as having weak or tender eyes. Here's what that means. Rachel is beautiful and Leah is beautiful challenged, okay? (laughs) She's not very pretty. It's just the way it is. And so here's what happens. Jacob now falls madly in love with Rachel. Are you seeing a little Hallmark plot line here and all this? It's crazy, right? This is not stale religious, uh, you know, folklore here. I mean, this this, this is the way God has worked through humanity, 
And so Jacob falls madly in love with Rachel. And he says to Uncle Laban, I want to marry Rachel. She's beautiful. I, just, I love her. I'm enamored with her. And Laban says, well, I'll tell you what, man. You worked for me seven years. And at the end of that seven years, you can marry her. That's kind of my approach with my future sons-in-law. That's kind of what I'm going to do. You work for me. Little landscaping, right? Little, okay. Seven years. No. All right. So he says, you work for me seven years. You can have her. And the Bible said, this is interesting, that for Jacob, the seven years, he was so in love with Rachel, the seven years were as nothing. Fellas, that's a good thing to write on the Christmas card this year to your wife, okay? <laughs> These 30 years together have been like a week. <laughs> At times, not a very good week, but it's been like a week, <laughs> right? <laughs> no. so, so Jacob's like, so in love, like the seven years just passed. He's like, no big deal. And they get to the end of the seven years. Here's what happens. They have their wedding. And Rachel is dressed in traditional, you know, wedding regalia. And she's got her veil and all of this. And they go through the wedding and the reception. And then Jacob and Rachel go to their honeymoon suite. And then um, he wakes up the next morning. <laughs> Hallmark alert. Let me show it to you. When morning came, this is just how abruptly the text says it, okay, Genesis 29. When morning came, let me show it to you. There was Leah, the ugly one. <laughs> the dude woke up the morning after his honeymoon and he married the wrong sister. If you've ever woken up the morning of your honeymoon and said, wait, you're not the right sister. We have counseling available for you. <laughs> All right? This is messed up. And so he says to Laban, now don't miss the irony here. What is this you have done to me? Wasn't it for Rachel that I worked for you? Now watch this. Why have you deceived me? Now you know why that's important? Because that's the exact same question his father asked him when he stole his brother's blessing. And so he's got, to, he's got to work longer for Rachel. But he's able to marry her. They begin to have children. The problem is Leah can have children. Rachel cannot. And so he has sons with Leah, but he doesn't ever love Leah. He loves Rachel. And then it gets in this weird scenario, Hallmark Channel alert, where each of the two women, Rachel and Leah now, um, are competing for the love and affection of Jacob. Of course, Jacob's always given it to Rachel, never to Leah. And at one point, Rachel, you know, she can't have kids. And so she says, okay, why don't you take my servant girl and have children with her? And then Leah's like, oh, well, I have a servant girl too. This is a messed up situation. <laughs> and... Um, he has 10 sons, none with Rachel, but later in life, Rachel, the Lord opens up her womb and she has a son born to Jacob. His name is Joseph. Yes, that Joseph. And then she actually dies giving birth to her second child, a second son born to Jacob. His name was Benjamin. And guess what Jacob does with Joseph and Benjamin, the same thing his father did to he and Esau. He favors Joseph, the son, firstborn son, of the woman he loved over all the other boys. Now guess where that landed them? In a situation where after Joseph got this fancy coat of many colors, his brothers said, I'm sick and tired of him being the favorite, and they sought to kill him. And the dysfunction is perpetuated over and over and over again. But I have some good news for you today. God is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. And, and there's a couple things that happen in Jacob's life, like literally right in the middle of all this dysfunction, okay, right in the middle of all of this madness. Like there's a couple amazing things that happen. First of all, you may remember there's this moment where Jacob ends up wrestling a man who he recognizes as a divine figure. He literally begins to wrestle with God through the night and Jacob knows that he's wrestling with God and at one point his hips put out of, 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 of place and, and there's this powerful moment where Jacob realizes like he's wrestling with God and, and 
And he's, he's given this blessing, right? And then before that, like right, again, right in the middle of all this dysfunction, Jacob goes to sleep one night and he has this dream, which is a vision. It's a powerful vision. It's a powerful dream where God's doing something great in his life, despite all this dysfunction. Let me, let me just show it to you. Genesis 28, at sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and he stopped there for the night and Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to go to sleep. Yep, that's just the way it was back then, no pillows, okay? And as he slept, watch this, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. And at the top of the stairway stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord. I am the God of your grandfather Abraham and I am the God of your father Isaac and the ground you are laying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you, I'm giving it to your descendants and your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions to the west and the east, to the north and the south and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and through your descendants. And what's more, the Lord says, I am with you and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I'll bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I finish giving you everything that I have promised you. And here's what God says to Jacob. In the middle of all this dysfunction, in the middle of his mess, God comes to him on two different occasions and he says, I am going to be faithful to the promises that I gave your grandfather. I am going to be faithful to the covenant that I've established with you and your family. Yeah, you stole your brother's birthright and blessing, and yeah, you, you, you're, you're living a life like it's a little messed up, it's a little, a little dysfunctional, but you know what? I'm going to be faithful to you, and I'm gonna give you this land, I'm gonna honor what I told your grandfather I was gonna do, for I am the Lord. And Jacob has this vision, this stairway to heaven, where these angels are running up and down and the Lord is there and he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm in complete control here and I'm gonna do what I promised to do. No matter how bad things get with you dysfunctional human beings. <laughs> and I know what some of you are thinking right now. What in the world is this guy talking about at Christmas time? It's all right, I can say it for you. I know you're thinking it. Like, I came to church today, the second Sunday of December. I wanted to sing some Christmas songs. I wanted to hear a good Christmas message. And you're talking about Jacob and his messed up family. What in the world is this guy talking about? Where are the angels? Where are the wise men? Where are the shepherds? Where's sweet baby Jesus lying in a manger? Well, I wanna show you a moment in um, Jesus' life where he helps to connect for us what happened with Jacob and what he came to accomplish for you and me. See, we, we started last week looking at John's gospel and how John, like, in this opening chapter of his historical record is emphasizing here the power of Jesus, the glory of Jesus, right? The fact that Jesus is the son of God. And, and today at the end of chapter one, I wanna show you a moment in Jesus' ministry where he's calling his first disciples to himself and he's having some interactions with some of these first believers and these first followers. And, and I wanna show you how Jesus connects his present ministry to his past ministry. In other words, I wanna show you I'm not crazy. <laughs> I know it's Christmas, but I, I think maybe you, some of us have missed this, you know, in our understanding of God's historical record. Let, let me show you what happened. John 1, 43, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said, come and follow me. Again, Jesus calling his first disciples now, his first followers, okay? Follow me. That's the command. Follow me. Give up everything else in your life. Follow me. I'm worth it. I'm worthy of it, Right? And so Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. And Philip then, so excited about having met the Messiah, right? The Lord. He, he goes and he looks for Nathaniel, right? And he's like, hey, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. We got him. His name is Jesus. He's the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And there's this like buildup, like, oh yeah, Nathaniel's gonna be so pumped. Nope, Nathaniel says, uh, Nazareth? Can 
anything good come from Nazareth? Phil's like, dude, you gotta come see for yourself. Now let me just pause here because Nazareth was podunk. Nazareth was just a hole in the wall. Nazareth had no prominence whatsoever. And, and Nathaniel's rightly thinking like what we would think if I told you, hey, we have found the Messiah, or we found the next president, or we have found the next king kind of thing. Oh, educated Ivy League or born into this family. Or no, 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 he's from podunk. And there was just kind of this saying of like, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This little hole in the wall, like poor, insignificant town. Nathaniel's like, hold up, bro. Like I, I'm glad you're excited about finding this Messiah guy, but I don't think he's coming out of Nazareth. And certainly with a father who's a carpenter. And so Philip said, just come and see. You just gotta come and meet him. So watch what happens next. And so as they approached Jesus says, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity, talking about Nathaniel. And Nathaniel says, uh, hey man, appreciate the compliment, but we've never met. You don't know anything about me. Like, I appreciate the compliment, but how, how are you saying that? And Jesus says, um, you know what? When you were under the fig tree the other day, meditating, praying, there's something here that Philip, uh, or excuse me, that Nathaniel was doing, um, I saw you there before Philip came up to you. And Nathanael said, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Now John's giving us a condensed description of what happened, no doubt. We don't know for sure what Nathanael was doing underneath the fig tree. Here's what we do know. It was so meaningful to him and it was so private that he knew, he knew nobody else was around. No one could have known he was there, right? Maybe it was a part of his regular practice. We don't know. What we do know is that, that, that he was so private in that moment that when Jesus referenced it, he immediately knew, yeah, this man knows things that no one else can know. And no one could know those things unless he is the son of God. Again, this is John's emphasis. Jesus is no ordinary human being. He is God in human flesh. He's demonstrating it, right? This is John's concern to show you that, okay, this isn't some little sweet baby in a feeding trough only. He's not just a, no, no, no. This is God wrapped in human flesh and Jesus is already demonstrating this and Nathaniel gets it. He's like, walks into this conversation very skeptical. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And um, he leaves this initial meeting like, wow, you are the, You're the Messiah. No one could have known I was there, right? And then look at what Jesus says. This is typical Jesus. Like, hey, I appreciate your compliment, but uh, hey, dude, I don't think you fully understand. And so this isn't Jesus pouring cold water, but this is Jesus like trying to bring a broader perspective. Look at what he says. He says, well, do you believe in me just because I told you that I saw you underneath that fig tree where nobody else could see you? Hey, man, I just want you to know, if you'll come follow me, right, here's what... You're gonna see way greater things than this. And then are you ready for the big conclusion at the end of our Hallmark movie? And then Jesus said this, I'll tell you the truth, you will see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. See, I told you I'm not crazy. (laughs) Maybe you missed this. God revealed himself to Jacob in the midst of his dysfunction and said, I'm a God who's a faithful, covenant-keeping God. And this vision that you're seeing now of, of angels running up and down this stairway to heaven and me on top of it speaking and declaring that you're gonna have this land and I'm gonna bless your family and I'm gonna keep my covenant. I'm giving this to you because I I don't ever want you to forget in the midst of all of your dysfunction and brokenness that I'm a God who loves you and I'm a God who's faithful to you. God gave Jacob this stairway as a reminder that God is absolutely faithful to his people 100% of the time. But listen to me, please don't miss this. Jesus did not say to Nathaniel, hey, God has made a stairway. 
Hey, hey, Nathaniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You impressed that I, I told you what you were doing underneath that fig tree and you're impressed with that? Hey, cool. You know what? God's made a stairway and there's angels running up and down on it. It's a pretty cool thing. No, no, that's not what Jesus says. You know what Jesus says? Hey, Nathaniel, I'm gonna actually show you greater things than this because I am the stairway. I am the pathway from earth to heaven. You think it's cool that I have like unlimited knowledge? I do because I'm God. But I'm actually gonna show you something greater than this. I'm gonna show you what it looks like for God to come down to man, not just stand and speak on top of the staircase, but to come down to man because I'm gonna give my life for you. I'm gonna take the, the punishment for your sin for you and I'm gonna be raised from the dead for you and I'm gonna conquer death and I'm gonna conquer hell and I'm gonna conquer your dysfunction and I am going to bring salvation to you because I don't just walk down the stairway or up the stairway, I am the stairway. I am the bridge between earth and heaven, right? I am the, the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can get to God except through me. And I want you to know today, in your little version of your Hallmark movie, <laughs> whatever dysfunction you carried in the room with you today, whatever brokenness you've seen in your family, whatever struggles you've had or are having, whatever your past or whatever your present, no matter how good things are or no matter how bad things are, I wanna give you a word of encouragement today. God loves you, God is with you, God is for you, God is faithful to you because he has given his son to you who is the stairway between us and him. And he is with you in every season and circumstance in life. This is Christmas. Jesus is the bridge between heaven and earth. There's no way to God, there's no way to heaven except through Jesus. That's what he's saying. Nathaniel, you think it's cool I called out where you were underneath this fig tree? No, 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 wait. Just wait a couple years from now when I die on this Roman cross for your sin. Just wait till I come and see you after my bodily resurrection and just wait until one day I call you home to be with me. Jesus is the bridge. Here's, here's, here's what the scripture says in another place. There is one God, okay, this is important. There is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. There is one. And he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And this is the message that God gave to the world at just the right time. Jesus is the stairway to heaven. Whether or not you have Led Zeppelin in the back of your mind or not, all right? <laughs> they weren't the first ones to come up with that. Jesus is the stairway to heaven. He's the bridge between heaven and earth. And if you're here today and you, you don't know that you have eternal life, you're here today and... Um, you're not sure where you stand with this God who's gonna judge the world one day? You don't know if you're gonna spend eternity in heaven or hell? I, I want you to know today, this salvation's available to you through Jesus. He's the bridge, he's the stairway. Not that he comes down and up the stairway, he is the stairway. And what he gave to Jacob in terms of a revelation was fulfilled ultimately in Jesus. And all you need to do is acknowledge your sin and your brokenness, your dysfunction, much like Jacob and his family, and just say, God, I need you. God, I ask you to save me from my sin. God, I ask you to come into my life. And God, I commit to follow you. And if you'll do that, God will save you. He'll give you a peace that passes all understanding. He will absolutely bless your life. Things won't always be easy, right, in this broken world, but God will be with you. This is the message of Christmas. And if you're a Christ follower today, listen to me very, very carefully, Bell Scholes. I want you to understand no matter what you face, no matter your ups and downs, your good decisions, bad decisions, you have a Savior who is the stairway. He's given you access from earth to heaven. One day you will hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so you keep pressing on, you keep honoring the Lord, you keep following him because he is faithful to us in every season. He is with us, right? 
And, and I love what the scripture says, that there is one God and one mediator between God and man. That's Jesus. He's the stairway, right? He's the one that makes it possible for us to have access to God and access to heaven. And, and, and then I love this word, that, 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 that this is the message that God gave the world at just the right time. And so here's what we do. We're, we're trying not just to honor the Lord and live for the Lord and make much of the Lord, but we're trying to make him known to the world before it's too late. Because this is the right time. This is the right window. And that's why here at Bell Shoals, we make it a priority to get this good news to the world at just the right time. That there's a stairway between earth and heaven, and his name is Jesus. He is the gate. He is the door. He is the light of the world. And that's why we do things like what we did yesterday with our Real Hope Christmas party. You gave so generously over the past few weeks. Bikes, toys, <laughs> man, it was unbelievable. If this is your first time at Bell Shoals, I just want you to know we do something every year called the Real Hope Christmas Party. You'll see some photos here from yesterday. We just throw a big party for some families that have various needs in our community. We wanna be a blessing to our community. We wanna try to get this hope to our community. We wanna try and get this good word of God's love to our community at just the right time while there is still time. And so one of the ways we do this is by meeting needs, right? And so everyone comes in. Uh, this is in our gymnasium. It's absolutely packed. It's pushed to the limit. We have maximized the, as many people as we can accommodate. And uh, we, 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 we give... Uh, uh, you know, hot chocolate and orange juice and a wonderful brunch and uh, sprinkles and whipped cream because you can't have hot chocolate without whipped cream and sprinkles. It's a rule, okay? And um, we have crafts and uh, we do a little program and we, we have some, there's a guy on a unicycle. That's not originally part of what we had planned, but um, uh, it's kind of a bring your own unicycle event apparently, all right? And uh, there's some of our team. We had, uh, I don't that guy on the right, I don't even want to talk about. All right, so... <laughs> That was a whole other situation. All right, and then uh, we have two elves here. Uh, a couple of our staff members, uh, Josiah and Lala Stroud. Uh, they, their names were Jojo and Lala the elves, but the kids called him Ho-Ho. So um, I don't know, they just go with it. So we have this program for them. We share the gospel, communicate our love. Then they have an elf walk. You'll see this through our kids' building, and they get candy canes and uh, some toys and whatever little things. And uh, it's just super, super precious and then uh, after the elf walk, they come right over here to uh, out there by the fountain, right? And we have all these families and all these kids right out there by the fountain, um, and it's super cool. And then Pastor Jaime, our Espanol campus pastor, and I stand at the st top of the steps, and we, uh, you know, get all the kids up front, and it's just all these kids. And, of course, over the past few weeks, you have been providing gifts that the kids have actually asked for. Every child has a bike. In Bell Shoals, let me just tell you, every child has a toy, every child, or multiple toys. Every child has a bike, and it has their name on it. Because we believe that every name is important to God. I mean, it's not just you walk in like, and there's just these gifts. Like, I'm just telling you, every bike has the child's name. Every toy has the child's name. It's just, our team does an amazing job. There's these massive boxes with the bikes next to them, and the gifts are individually wrapped in the boxes, all right? And then Jaime and I count down, three, two, one, and, the, and they run through uh, up the steps, and they get to the pillars, and then we have these snow machines, and it's blowing snow everywhere, which looks like dandruff. So it's... Uh, <laughs> It's what I call Florida snow, all right? <laughs> and so it's just cool. The snow, kids are running through the snow, and then they get their, um, they get their gifts. And uh, I just can't even describe to you what it's like. I try to do it every year, but I just, it's hard to describe, you know, the situation. Um, we, we had some kids this year. I hadn't seen this in previous years. They just got to their bikes, and they were so pumped about their bikes, they didn't even open their other gifts. <laughs> It's like, oh, hold up, we're not done yet. And like they're out by the fountain riding their bike. We had a kid this year with Pastor Jason. He's just got a history with kids and bikes, man. I don't know what the issue is, but he got this precious little girl on her bike and sent her out and she, she was headed toward the steps. And I was starting to call our attorney <laughs> when thankfully Jason got her and turned her out the back. But I mean, these kids, it's just, it's so precious. There's the Florida snow and um, man, it was awesome, right? I mean, it was awesome. So let me, let me give you a couple quick stories. I just want you to understand, Bell Schultz, this is why we do what we do. Because there's a stairway between heaven and earth. 
there's one mediator between God and man, and this mediator has come to us at just the right time. And while there's still time, and it's the right time, we're going to try and get as many people as we can to know and love Jesus and follow him that they might have eternal life. So let me, let me show you a couple of families here, uh, a couple of cool stories real quick. Uh, next slide, if you don't mind. This is a little girl that I got to hang out with. Um, Asu is her name. She's from Turkey. She and her mother are here. Um, her mother came over to work, has a marketing degree, had a hard time finding a job. She's kind of working some side jobs to make ends meet for now. And they're waiting for Asu's father and um, her mother's husband to, to come over from Turkey. They've been here three years waiting on him. And um, we were able to provide some help to them this Christmas. There she is. I mean, a precious girl. Listen, I don't know which one of you did this, okay? One of you. One of you went to the store and you bought on the bottom there, that's Barbie's vacation house. Because Barbie has multiple homes, okay? Uh, <laughs> she put on her Christmas list this year, Barbie's vacation house. One of you went to the store and you bought that house for her. There it is. And a couple Barbies. And uh, of course she got her bike. And um, I'll tell you, this is the most precious girl. Her mother told us every single time they go to Walmart, she asked for that Barbie vacation house. And her mother couldn't get it for her. One of you did. And uh, we had some gospel conversations come out of that. I, I helped her ride her bike. It was so sweet. We're going. We, we went a little bit, and I'm running along. Honestly, I'm starting. I should have stretched first. <laughs> and, um, and it went well. And I said, okay, you want to you ride some more? I'm trying to teach her to ride a bike. And she says, yes. And so we take off. She goes, yes, but do not let go of me. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I got it. And uh, I tell you, I mean, a precious girl and just the joy. I mean, I just can't even tell you the impact um, of those gifts. Okay, let me show you another family. It was just incredible. Um, this is a family. Um, there were three kids, a little bit older, as you can see. And uh, there's a young man, CJ. Check this out. Never had a bike, never ridden a bike. And CJ walked in. We noticed he was kind of sheepish early on in the program and everything. He was older, so I'm sure he felt a little bit out of place. You know, he's kind of at this party, and there's a lot of little kids, and then there's him. And, um, and he walked in after the big reveal in the snow, and he got to his box, and he saw he had a bike. He's never had a bike before. He started crying. And he got, listen, he got the two best gifts a young man his age could ever get, a bike and a Chick-fil-A gift card. I mean, living the dream right there, baby. Oh, man. And then you can see his sister behind him. I mean, I'm just telling you, these kids, the best part is seeing them go out there, like, riding these bikes. And then there's Grandma, who also has never been on a bike. And she's actually on a bike. I don't know which bike it is. <laughs> and we got a picture of her, so grateful and just so impactful. And then last family I want to I talk to you about. Okay, we have so many stories. This is a precious family that came. Check this out. All of this is born out of, by the way, every Wednesday we have a ministry called Real Hope where we give food, groceries, other needs to families. They come through um, a car line and, and we provide, you know, necessities to hundreds of families. Um, it's just incredible. So every week we do this on Wednesdays. This, this precious mother came through the Real Hope car line Back in November, we invited her, of course, to church. She came to our Espanol campus Sunday, November 26, and she gave her life to Christ. Isn't that amazing? She gave her life to Christ. So check this out. Her husband came through the Real Hope car line the following week on Wednesday, invited him to our Espanol campus. For the first time last week in December, they came to our Espanol campus as a family. He gave his life to Christ. Isn't that great? I mean, that's awesome. That's awesome. They were already in our queue for the Real Hope Christmas party, came, kids got their bikes and gifts that you provided, and all of that was an avenue to introduce them to Jesus, the stairway between earth and heaven, the one mediator between God and man, and the one who's come to give us eternal life. And while it's the right time, and there's still time, guess why we do what we do here at Bell Shoals? because we want to get the hope of Jesus to all of these families before it's too late. And I just want to say thank you. You bought these gifts, you brought in these bikes by the hundreds. <laughs> we, we're ministering to over 500 children this year. And, um, 
I know you may not realize the full impact of these things, but little Asu getting her Barbie vacation house and that bike and the gospel conversations coming out of that with her and her mother, I'm just telling you, the toys are great and the bikes are cool. That's a means to an end. But you're making it possible. The missionaries we support, the people we're sending overseas, the challenge for you to get on mission with us this next year, all of this is all about this one simple reality. God has come to us through the person of Jesus. He is the stairway. There is still time right now for you to respond to him, to ask for his forgiveness, to commit to love him and to follow him all the days of your life. And if you'll do that, he'll save you. And if he's already saved you, then here's my encouragement. Let's continue to follow him, to live for him, to give for him, right? To impact others for him because... One day, we're gonna be around our Savior face to face. That'll be a sweet day and hear the words, well done.